Also, I would like to request you to put your phones on silent. Okay. Um, welcome, everybody, to the Ties That Bind Us reading Marcus today. So we are basically going to talk about Gabriel Garcia Marcus. In this session, we revisit his legacy. Master storyteller from Colombia, Marcus won the Nobel Prize of Literature in 1982. Um, in India, he is one of the more admired Spanish language writers because of his views of magical realism in many of his pioneering works. So it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists. We have already met A.J. Thomas, an Indian poet who writes in English, an editor and celebrated translator of several illustrious Malayalam writers. He served as the editor of the Sahitya Academy journal Indian Literature and co-edited the best of Indian literature and the greatest Malayalam stories ever told that we have heard about just yesterday. He received the Katha Award, AKMG Prize, and Vodafone Crossword Award. He holds a senior fellowship from the Department of Culture, Government of India, and was an honorary fellow, Department of Culture, honorary fellow in South, South Korea. He has been an invited speaker in several writers' conferences and readings in South Korea Australia, Thailand, Hong Kong, and Nepal. Charu Nivedita is the author of nearly 100 works in Tamil, ranging from the collections of essays to novels, poetry collections, and short stories. Some of his better known works include Marginal Man, To Byzantium, A Turkey Travelogue, Unfaithfully Yours, Mark Keeper, and Towards a Third Cinema. The translation of his work, Conversations with Aurangzeb, a novel, won a grant at the inaugural PEN presentation translation competition. He experiments with writing forms and satirizes his early struggles and foray into writing in his autofiction novels. These have been critically acclaimed and translated into different languages and his most popular work, Zero Degree, is included in the university syllabi across the globe. Pallavi Narayan has authored Pamuk's Istanbul, The Self and the City, and co-edited Singapore at Home, Life Across Lines. She worked in academia and book publishing in Singapore and India, including Nanyan Technological University, National University of Singapore, Penguin Random House, Pan Macmillan, and Rutledge. She has been a fellow of the Jalan Besar Fellowship with Singh Lit Station, Singapore. South Asia Speaks, CHCI, Mellon Global Humanities Institutes at Universidad de Chile. Santiago and National Yang Ming Chiago Tung University and Kutch University Center for Asian Studies, Istanbul. Currently, she is an associate professor of practice, School of Arts and Sciences at Ahmedabad University, and is establishing the Ahmedabad Writing Program and University Press as their director. We have also met our moderator of the session, Karthik Venkatesh. Karthik is an executive editor for fiction and nonfiction at Penguin Random House India. His articles have been featured in the Hindu, Mint Lounge, Deccan Herald, and The Federal. His first book, written for young adults, titled 10, 10 Indian Languages and How They Came to Be, was published by Duckbill in February 2024. Over to you, Karthik. Can I start? Yes. So yes. good afternoon. Very happy to be here with this August panel. Uh, to speak about Marquez, a writer I think all of us are familiar with, and I'm sure many of us uh, deeply love. And it's, uh, in a way, what can I say? It's, it's a coincidence that we are speaking about Marquez today. Uh, barely a month, month and a half ago, uh, a book by him was released until August. 
uh, a book I think he left unfinished for reasons of uh, you know not being able to finish it, dementia and other issues specific to the novel as well. But which his sons I think decided to publish and there has been criticism of their decision. Some have welcomed it, some have you know panned the whole idea and so on and so forth. So in a way I mean Marcus has kind of come back into literary consciousness. I say this very uh, deliberately. Uh, saying he has come back into literary consciousness or discussion again is perhaps not right. And that's what I want to ask all of you uh, to begin with. Uh, Marcus died more than 10 years ago. And uh, he was probably not very active for a few years before that. But he's always been around in so many different ways. So Marcus is an ever-present, omnipresent figure in the literary space. Would you agree if I say that? May I request the lady to start first, if that's okay with the gentleman? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Yeah, I, I think um, Marquez is, you know, one of the defining sort of writers of of many generations, especially here. You know, we've all studied him. I, I mean, we've all studied him as, you know, a literature graduate. I mean, definitely Marquez defined, uh, you know, the literary landscape of Latin America for me. And I think a lot of... Uh, the kind of you know postmodernism and magical realism and even postcolonialism that is you know prevalent in his works is something that I have uh, you know seen in different formats appear across other writers who are more contemporary who are also living writers at this point in time. So yeah. What would you say? Marquez has always been around, hasn't left. Um, in Tamil literary milieu, there was uh, Russian literature. Uh, Everywhere, you know, there was, um, we, we had all uh, Russian masters and um, me and uh, some of um, my fellow writers have introduced uh, Latin American uh, writers like Yuan Rulfo and many people, many, I have translated uh, many of uh, Latin American writers. I translated Marquez also. Marquez was one of uh, the Masters, Alejo Carpentier of Cuba, and uh, 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 for a major uh, influence in Tamil Nadu, in Tamil literature. Ivan Rulfo, Alejo Carpentier, and uh, Carlos Fuentes, uh, Pablo Neruda. Uh, there is a publication, you know, Chili Quill, um, Pablo Neruda, and uh, the anti poet, uh, I forgot his name, um, uh, Nikonar Parra. There are many, you know, they are, their names are household names in Tamil Nadu, and Marquez is one of them. And uh, we have not been influenced by magical realism in Tamil Nadu, in Tamil literature, no magical realism. We were influenced by existentialism and uh, structuralism, Michel Foucault, Roland Barthes, Sartre, Oliver Camus, uh, Actually, Tamil Nadu is a, is a part of France, you can say. <laughs> like that. <I did. laughs> so, they don't know French, but everywhere you can uh, listen to... Why, 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 why is that? I mean, you ah, because, read Marquez, but because not... Uh, magical realism magic. is there in, in our uh, soil. Uh, Mahabharatam is a, you know. And Borges is a household name in, in Tamil Nadu. Borges. So, we... Uh, we saw, we perceived the magical realism as a literary genre, a, a style, not as a philosophy, but existentialism is a philosophy. Structuralism, postmodernism is a philosophy. It, it created, it opened a lot of things, you know. We, 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 uh, we have uh, denounced this closed, structured uh, texts, all open-ended. And I was one of the the you know uh, into the, uh, the people who introduced ex uh, my first novel is existentialism and fancy bunyan i mocked at sartre we mocked at sartre we played with him you know so for us magical realism is a style but this is philosophy but um, in you know in, in existentialism fancy bunyan without 
magical realism. It is a story of 100 years of solitude. Yes. Thank you. That is an influence, you can say. I have a specific question for you, which is a kind of a follow-up to yeah. the larger question I asked. When Marcus died in, 20, 000, in 2014, uh, Kerala actually celebrated uh, him a great deal. And when Marcus won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1982, the joke was that he's the first Malayali writer to win the Nobel Prize because Marcus is so popular, yeah. right? So, I mean, in that sense, Kerala has held on to him like one of its own, hasn't it? As I haven't they? You're right, uh, Vinkatesh. It is, uh, I think, uh, uh, Marquez is our official Nobel Prize winner. Right. So, they, <laughs> they, they, no, this is not what I said. This is a Facebook and Twitter, uh, 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 this thing that was going around around the time of his death. That's exactly that. It's there. It's there on a record. But uh, the, uh, the funniest part is that, you know, uh, like, you know, N.S. Mathavan, one of the all-time greats of uh, modern Malayalam uh, short fiction and fiction. He is one of his uh, short stories, uh, like uh, 1002 Nights, you know, there is a reference to Nandini, a character says. So the, uh, the great uh, Malayalam writer Marquez, <laughs> say, you know, like that, you know, <laughs> officially puts down there. Uh, another, uh, you know, very well-known uh, academic, uh, Professor Meena T. Pillai, uh, you know, has a caption of her very serious uh, academic essay. Uh, it's about the development, uh, the origin and development of Malayalam and its uh, expansion through translation and all that. But the essay is titled, Is Marquez a Malayali? <laughs> <laughs> so this kind of uh, uh, owning Marquez, you know, it's there. And I um, just read that essay like this morning. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, was quite yeah, illuminating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, this, uh, funnily enough, you know, like uh, Mr. Charu Nivedita said, we have our magical, magical realisms from, you know, it's there. It right. is, you know, in, in Malayalam prose, uh, you know, the stories of uh, Aidi Hemala, so written about uh, 100 years ago, uh, serialized in. Uh, uh, Malayalam Manorama's Bhasha uh, Pushni uh, uh, literary magazine. It's a seven volume uh, compendium of legends, mostly of Kerala, but of South India and other parts of India also. These are replete with really magical realist stories, but no one called them magical, magical realism. realism right. And uh, uh, Obi Vijayan's Kasakandi Dihasam, you know, you have. Uh, 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 Shaikh Kamburan, you know, Shaikh is a uh, is a person. He is a spectral presence, but it's a very real person. And all these, you know, like Marcus said about his characters, uh, his uh, magical realist events and all that. None of them were made up. They were all there. That's what Marcus says. So, like this in uh, Malayalam literature also. There is, a, say, U.A. Uh, Khader, there is a writer who uh, began writing in the early 60s, but he changed over to a style, which is magical realist, parallel to Marcus. So U.A. Khader is a great uh, influence in uh, modern Malayalam fiction. So this has been happening in Malayalam, and I think it, this uh, kind of an atmosphere made us ready to... Uh, accept Marquez, you know, yeah. <laughs> with, with uh, unconditional acceptance and uh, admiration, adulation. And, you know, when this uh, novel, uh, 100 Years of Solitude, was translated in 1980, uh, 81 and published, you know, the people, the ordinary people, you know, working class, they, uh, not, they, they couldn't even um, afford a BD, on, like that, that kind of people you know, bought unauthorized, cheap versions, and they used to read them in their, you know, uh, for all other practical purposes, they're all impoverished lot. <laughs> they used to read the 100 Years of Solitude in this uh, threadbare version. Would you read? So this kind of a thing, and there is a background to that. Why? Because uh, somehow Marquez and, you know, uh, uh, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara. So after the 1968 Naxalite blooming, mm -hmm. a crop of youngsters 
in Kerala, they were so taken up with the idea of revolution, the romantic idea of revolution, that right. they've jumped into it. It's history. You know, everyone knows about the Varghese and uh, so many things that happened in Kerala. So they, 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 they were readily identifying with, you know, the, the Cuban hero, uh, Che Guevara, and uh, Fidel Castro, by extension, Marquez. These people used to go to um, uh, AKG Center, you know, the Marxist headquarters. Mm -hmm. There, they used to have the, uh, the Cuban, uh, I forget the name of the newspaper, where Mar uh, Marquez used to write a column. Not, not uh, fiction or anything, but mm -hmm. just to hang on to his uh, writing. This is what they used to Yeah, grandma, yeah, grandma. So this kind of uh, uh, ready uh, acceptance among the youth, the so-called revolutionary, quote unquote, youth, that and the emergency which came for, no, M.T. Vasudevanar had introduced this book through his uh, unique uh, Alkuta del Tenye, it is, it is a unique travel book, you know, alone in the crowd. After his uh, visit to uh, USA, mostly New York and Washington, he had written such a novel in which he describes how Arthur Miller is uh, so inaccessible, shut away in his castle, you know, that kind of, that uh, uh, book also mentions about Marquez and his works, you know. Mm -hmm. So, M.T. Vasudevanar is such an influential writer, so <laughs> Marquez got an easy advertisement through his writing. So, right. these are the... So my uh, question to you is, uh, and I'm asking, uh, asking you to kind of look at your own personal history. Uh, when did you first encounter Marquez? Do you remember the time, the context, the circumstances? In uh, early 80s, uh, after reading um, 100 Before is Solitude. Before Nobel Prize or after? Uh, before. Before. Uh, before Nobel. Uh, when, uh, you know, there are a lot of Che Guevara name in, in Tamil Nadu. A lot of people, you know, the, the children's name, Che Guevara. So as Mr. Thomas said, mm. So, you know, uh, there, there are no Lenins or Stalins, but a lot of Che Guevara's there. <laughs> uh, they have translated his uh, Gorilla Warfare and the Bol Bolivian Diary. And when uh, Mario Vargas Josa uh, got Nobel, uh, some hundred people congratulated me. <laughs> Such a funny thing. So, um, after reading uh, 100 Days of Solitude, the Ursula, I, I found Ursula as my grandma. You know, you know the the Colonel uh, uh, Aurelia uh, Buendia, is it right? Uh, Colonel Aure Aurelia Buendia is is our Karnanidi. <laughs> there are a lot of similarities there. You know, <laughs> the unfortunate thing is we 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 have not followed uh, magical realism. It it did not up, you know you know. So when you when you read him, what was your first reaction? If I if you can remember. Ah uh, ah. Uh, I found him as a, uh, though he's a politically naive person, uh, but he's, st he's a great storyteller. And um, like uh, Mario Vargas jo Josa, he was a rightist. Uh, Josa was a rightist and he's a leftist. Right. But his uh, leftism is very naive. After uh, emergency, he came to India, uh, you know, upon the uh, invitation of uh, Indira Gandhi. He was, a, he was a friend of Indira Gandhi. He had no criticism of emergency. So he was very, you know, praising Indira Gandhi as, a, uh, as a Fidel Castro, as, a, as Che Guevara. And this political naive thing is there. But he's a great storyteller. He influenced me a lot. Because of 100 Years of Solitude, I wrote Existentialism and Fancy Bunny. It was a family Do story. you remember the circumstances in which you re read Marquez first? Definitely. I was 17. It was 2002. I had first started my bachelor's in literature at Delhi University. And there came Bakondo and butterflies. And I even wrote, you know, poetry on butterflies inspired by, by Marquez. Marquez. And in fact, in this uh, book, you know, this Pamuk's Istanbul, um, in fact, I see, you know, Pamuk also very deeply affected by Latin American writing in terms of postmodernism, um, in terms of that circular repetitive narrative, which is so characteristic of him, Marquez, of uh, Borges, um, and also some, uh, you know, more contemporary writers, Juno Diaz, Alejandro Zambra, for example, whose works I greatly enjoy. 
I also feel there is this, you know, certain kind of a, um, even though Marquez doesn't use, for example, footnotes, some of these contemporary authors play around with that kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, annotation in their works. And I think that's quite interesting because I think it comes down from that modernist period of writing that, you know, Marquez uh, belongs to. But I feel he also kind of bridges a modernism, postmodernism sort of a writing, uh, which I think, you know, Pamuk does as well. Uh, very beautifully, and since I've devoted almost 10 years of my life to writing this, <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, you know, that's uh, that's uh, one place where, you know, I've tried to see... So when you were reading Pamuk, did you go back to Marquez? Yes, I think a couple of times, because, you know, Pamuk is also deeply affected by, by you know, Murakami, for example, I think, uh, and all of these, you know, sorts of postmodernism or beyond postmodernism sorts of writers are actually, you know, quite quite influenced by, by each other's work, I would think. So I have a whole chapter devoted just to that. What are these you know, influences playing? When did you first read Marquez? Must have been a while ago, many years ago. So it was in uh, 1981, I remember, I because you know, the book was not easily available. Mm. None of these uh, English books were uh, available in bookshops before Penguin India was you know, uh, opened their uh, uh, house in, uh, uh, in New Delhi and uh, Kushun Singh and co, uh, you know, started writing or promoting Indian English and writing. You know, there were Indian English writers before, mm -hmm. but they're available to books. You now that, uh, like Modern Book House in uh, Trivandrum, Trivandrum. Mm -hmm. they all flourished later with Krishnan Nair and a lot of things, backstories are there, but there's no time to say all that. But mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll tell you that, if, you know, in, in the course of my narration, if there is time. But uh, this particular case, uh, a friend of mine, Damu Nair, he was a budding uh, novelist himself. He was an agriculture officer working in Kumli. And I was in Thekadi, you know, Periyar Wildlife Sanctuary, I was working there. And uh, we used to meet each other often, you know, to discuss literature. And one fine morning he brought this book, you know, like smuggling from, you know, he had friend in uh, Trivandrum uh, Finance College where you know one of this one of his friends had uh, uh, you know borrowed from someone this particular book and he brought it to Kumli and I borrowed it for just a few days and finished reading in one sitting and that was that was a go to kind of <laughs> no, that was a kind of that was a kind of uh, you know because that was nothing like what I had read till then you know hmm. so that you know it it uprooted many of my you know, uh, ideas about uh, fiction writing and uh, uh, character formation, all the presentation of uh, this magical realism. I do not know it's called magical realism at that time, right, you know, right. but the kind of, you know, you have a reign that uh, goes on for four years, you have an insomnia plague, you have uh, blood trickling from a house and, you know, flowing down and down and going. It is, the, it is repeated in the Chronicle of uh, Death Portal also, it's there. And this yellow butterflies, and this uh, Remedios, the beauty, taken uh, ascending to heaven in body. Mm. You know, th this kinds of things. And Ursula, you know, as she uh, near, uh, nears uh, 120 years of age, mm. she becomes like a football, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She becomes, you know, she loses her size, and her great grandchildren, you know, uh, roll her about you know, like a toy. You know, this kind of uh, thing, this kind of writing, I had not read before. So that just blew me. Like, you know, I, I was uh, really taken up. Uh, and I had to reconsider many of my earlier notions of literature, reading Marquez. And I found that it is not me alone. Say something. Yeah. So it went on. Uh, the kind of... Uh, uh, engagement with Marquez um, in uh, 1989. My friend uh, V K Unikrishnan, his name is. He was a confidant and friend of U uh, R Anandamurthy, who was the vice chancellor of uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi University at that time. And we were friends, V K Unikrishnan and I. And uh, he took up the translation of uh, uh, Love in the Times of Cholera. Gotcha. And this man had, uh, you know cancer. He did not know at that time, but soon he found out. And he, like uh, Marquez wrote his uh, 
until August. He was translating it against his disease, defending, you know, pushing the cancer out and doing this uh, kind of committed kind of... Uh, he was a very literary man. He was a personal friend of uh, Leopold Sedar Sangor. He, was, he worked in Africa for a, a number of years. So this man, my personal, very, very close friend, withering away, while translating uh, Love in the Times of Cholera, and Love in the, time, Love in the Times of Cholera, just remember that, that, is, you know, the, the, uh, when Fermina Dasa and uh, Florentino Arisa embark upon this endless journey into the cholera-infested uh, Magdalena, up the Magdalena River, and sure death. So this kind of sure death this translator was facing, and that has gone into so many prints, you know, DC Books, I think, made a lot of money with that. Right. Yeah. I want to come back to what you said earlier yeah. when you called uh, Marquez politically mm -hmm. uh, naive, right? Um, in the sense, Marquez was a political writer mm -hmm. and uh, he seems to have influenced the political thinking of a number of people. So in that context, you're terming him, you know, what you did uh, is, is interesting. Uh, 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 and I just thought I could ask yeah, you to elaborate to on that point both of you to respond. <clears throat> I want to point. Sure. <laughs> I want to point out two things. Um, I travel a lot in uh, South America, um, visited Peru and all that. We are celebrating Marquez here, and we are talking about his connectivity with the Indian life and all that. But please think it over. They don't know anyone, any Indian writer, except Salman Rushdie and uh, Arundhati Rai. I am like Marcus, on par. If you read my Marginal Man or Zero Degree or anything, you can find the similarity. And, you know, I, I, am, uh, very sh I feel very shy to say this, but there is no one to tell. They don't know any Indian writer. This is one thing. But we are celebrating Marquez and all uh, Latin American guys. Uh, as a protest, I want to tell this. They don't know. They don't read. Why? One thing. The second thing is, as I said uh, earlier, Marquez is a great storyteller, uh, like uh, my friend Thomas said, uh, Ursula and so many things. You know greatest storyteller, but it's all external thing. But if you read Borges, he internalizes. He, he takes you to the philosophical um, uh, side of life. If you watch, uh, you know, when I watched uh, Inception, I said, this director must be a Borgesian uh, reader. And he was. So the time, he talks about time, and meta metafiction, he takes you to the, you know, he, he, he calls you to uh, perceive life, you know, in a philosophical way. He internalizes things. So, Bohr has influenced us. You know, it, it, we, we are uh, cinema guys, you know, the Tamil guys, you know, even now uh, the Vijay actor, Vijay has started a political party. Uh, but there is a very great literati. They are like philosophers. I wrote 130 books. They, I write like devil. This part is there in Tamil Nadu. They said there is a huge gap. I have only 1,000 readers. But uh, the thing is, we are Borgesian. We take the story from Marcus. You know, as I take uh, stories from my grandma. My grandma is like Ursula. <laughs> she told me so many stories. She came from Burma by walk you know, during the Second World War and all that. So when I read uh, Ursula, hi, my grandma is there. You know, that, that storytelling part, we took it from, you know, we take it from Latin American writers, but Borges is our master. And uh, Julio Cortazar. If you read the hopscotch, what a beautiful thing, you know. And the spiral thing. 
not a straight, uh, you know, don't feel that I uh, disown Marquez and all. No, no. He's my master, one of my masters. So, th this is the thing. Would you agree? Politically naive? I'm not sure about the political part as much, but I do know that a lot of his politics has played a, a big part in, you know, the way that uh, you know, post-colonialism has been structured in many books hence, in his own works of course, but also many other writers hence. But what I just wanted to comment upon very briefly with both uh, my fellow panelists who have just, uh, you know, talked about, uh, you know, um, inception and so on. I just wanted to mention that I think uh, fantasy fiction takes on a lot of uh, magical realism as well. So I was thinking when you were, you know, talking about I know, sure, this is but diametrically but opposite, maybe, you know, the where uh, Borges used sure, this intellectual, me, deeply finish, intellectual. Please? I was just talking about, you know, the, the, the grandmother as that, you know, football, uh, as a ball rolling along. If you would think of, you know, Charlie and uh, the chocolate factory, uh, you would also see similar influences playing around there, where that, you know, child becomes a ball. Um, um, and, you know, also I'm thinking of, you know, Pamuk's The New Life and those really long bus rides which are going nowhere in that novel, if any of you have read it, uh, The New Life. Um, yeah, so that also shows a certain kind of, you know, just, it's just going, going, going. There is a gesture towards something. We don't quite know what that gesture is towards. But that gesture in itself is reconstitutive of a kind of deconstruction that is taking place in the way that, you know, literary, uh, literary theory is functioning in a sense, if that's making any sense. But if one has to engage with it. Like sure, yeah, of course. Yeah. What would you say? Yeah, by the political aspect, you know, like he mm. said, if you have uh, read uh, Gerard Martin's uh, official biography of uh, Marquez, you'll see in his student days in Bogota, uh, Fidel Castro had come there and he nearly escaped an assassination attempt. You know, there was an explosion, there was a bomb blast in which um, uh, Fidel Castro nearly lost his life. So from then on, then then uh, uh, Marquez proactively takes him away. From that time on, he is into this kind of active politics. Politics is a very much a part of his uh, life. And uh, Fidel Castro and he were personal friends for uh, lifelong personal friends. Okay, but uh, in uh, when Fidel came to power, and uh, Marquez was. Uh, uh, in uh, Mexico for some time. He came to live in New York to represent the Cuban government, you know, actively. Just imagine, he was an a political agent of uh, Cuba. So, so he was so very directly political. And he was a deal maker, you know. Bill Clinton visited him mm. and tried to, you know, just to work out a solution to the, the imbroglio, like the, the Cuban problem. So, so many things active political advice uh, was sought of him by these people, uh, leaders. So you can say, no, say not merely in, in writing, in his writing, uh, politi politics is uh, implicit. You can say that he was an active politician, you know, like this. He was a negotiator, <laughs> like. Mm. So that is, you know, without being any, 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 any subtlety around it, he was actively and uh, unabashedly, openly political. So. Mm. I, that think I, I, I can't uh, say that uh, that's naive of him. He knew what he was doing. And why he did not uh, acknowledge uh, Indira Gandhi's uh, autocracy or the dictatorship, to my mind, he would have just seen that he would not have gone deeply into it. He would have just seen merely uh, because uh, Fidel Castro and Indira Gandhi were lifelong friends. So he would have just, you know, that it's Fidel's friend, so why should I bother? You know, this kind of thing. I want to ask you, and I had this question planned, but I think it's yeah. the right moment to ask it. Yeah. This uh, deep connection with Fidel Castro, yeah. right, uh, that Marquez had, yeah. right? Uh, would you say in some uh, some sense it compromised his ability to be critical of I think so. Of the, I, I really right? think so, because f uh, I, I think uh, Marquez was uh, worried that if Fidel goes on like this, being a dictator mm. to the outside world, he will lose his uh, 
real influence or something like that. And so he was being an apologist for uh, Fidel for long. That's all on record, you know. So you maybe say that, you know, you can say that he was even a little complicit in, in whitewashing. What happened? In whitewashing uh, Fidel Some Castro, you know, for right. all of us, uh, there are people who support Fidel as an anti-imperialist and uh, anti-US. So that's fine, that's politics. But Fidel was also an oppressor of his own people. Right, right. That, that's a fact, you know, as a writer, as a human being, hmm. I have to say that very much like Indira Gandhi was an oppressor, a dictator during the uh, emergency. And so there are so many of uh, the dictators coming up and going down. We see that in history. Right. But we writers and artists are always with humanists, with the human being, you know? Mm -hmm. But that, can we say uh, with certainty about Marquez? I doubt. Mm. Right. He you was were a deal maker. That's yeah. uh, for that matter, every Latin American writer and Central American writer is political. Uh, when Pinochet came to power in uh, uh, Chile, um, Pablo Neruda was poisoned. In 15 days, he died. So everybody, everybody, every writer in uh, Latin America is uh, political. Uh, wha well, you know, they, they are sent out as, a, as ambassador or exiled. These two things, you know, they, <laughs> it happened. So they become apologists? Or they, <laughs> yeah, they, 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 <laughs> they make an exit. Alejo Carpentier was a Cuban master, and Fidel Castro uh, sent him to Paris. For, for, for 20 years, he was an ambassador in Paris, Cuban. The ambassador so, to so we, we give, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. We give a lot of uh, importance uh, to Marquez alone uh, because of uh, you know, his Nobel Award winning and all, you know, something. But there are very great writers. For example, uh, you read Mario um, Luisa Bombal of Chile. She wrote a magical real story in 30s, decades before Marquez. La Ultima Niebla. La Ultima Niebla, the ultimate uh, uh, fog. The ultimate fog. She wrote it in 1940. I have translated that novel before my, you know, Marquez. So uh, somehow we give a lot of importance to uh, Marquez. When, when you go abroad, no, everyone talks about the uh, Salman Rushdie. Uh, hey, Baba, Salman Rushdie is not living in India. We have so many writers. <laughs> <laughs> so my like question it. to you as a professor of literature is specific. Uh, Marquez's influence on Indian literature uh, do you see it? Uh, would you would you say there was an influence, or was he just this uh, father figure, this this great figure who was out, up there and you know didn't really influence as much as you know was this person everyone looked up to and that's it. Well, at the time I was a student, certainly this was the case. But now when I you know actually I work a lot with contemporary writers. I teach a lot of living writers because I like to have them also come into my classroom and talk to my students. Uh, whether it's over, you know, Zoom or it's in person, um, and have them, you know, try and meet them at literature festivals and so on. But I, I feel uh, sometimes Marquez might be seen as a bit dated as of now, um, at least in this, you know, context, um, in this new, new India, so to say. Um, uh, I feel students still have a lot to learn from writers like that, but uh, I... Yeah, I also feel that they are not reading as much, and this is a, you know one of those discussions <laughs> that can become... That's an entirely yeah, different rabbit the, yeah. hole. So I'm not going to go there at all. But, uh, but yeah, I think um, we... Yeah, for some reason, we haven't talked about him in class so far. I have not talked about him in any of my classes, which is a little strange, considering I also feel that you know he ha has influenced the kinds of writings that I have delved into. But I suppose I've kept myself also to the very contemporary, like I was mentioning. Um, I think, again, it would differ university to university. I, would, I think it would also differ from, uh, from north to south to west to east, mm. region-wise as well. So I think perhaps in South India, there might be more focus, as you have you know, rightly said, and as you know, many papers have also uh, displayed. 
because um, I read some <laughs> to research on this panel. Yeah. So but specific yeah. to Malayalam, considering how deeply embedded he is in the Malayali literary landscape. There have been a couple of uh, novelists who followed this magical realist uh, trend, and there are many still, you know, influenced by the kind of the style of writing of Marquez. And uh, more importantly, more visibly in films, you know, Lijo Jules Pellicheri is one of the right. foremost, you know. He Delicata. Is, uh, yeah, Delicata. So he has uh, two films. One is Amen, and the other one is the E My Out. That's about the uh, last rites of a uh, Christian. Uh, this, both these films are magical realists in the, in the Marquesian uh, vein. Oh, yes. Yeah, right. Okay. And uh, uh, sitting at Indian literature for so many years, I have seen comparative, uh, uh, you know, essays, you know, dealing with Marquez in different languages, from Tamil, from Telugu, from Bengali, and uh, Punjabi. So many in uh, most of the Indian languages, the uh, the bigger uh, literatures, you know, there, uh, people somehow they are taken up with. You know, all, all these languages have Marcus uh, translations, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I used to get a number of essays, you know, with uh, this kind of uh, uh, magical realist uh, Marquesian uh, study. So this, this uh, is, is evident, because I had that uh, uh, place of privilege where I, ca I could have an eye on all of uh, Indian literatures. So I, I get this impression that Marcus has had his influence. So my specific question to you, since you're from Tamil Nadu, mm -hmm. we all know the huge influence of films on uh, the whole Tamil political and literary landscape. And uh, I mean, obviously, you're a fan of 100 Years of Solitude. So are you looking forward to the Netflix film? Are you worried about it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, we will have a very beautiful film, mm. uh, wonderful film. You're very optimistic. Yeah, yeah, very, very <laughs> optimistic. I want to see Colonel Aurelian of <laughs> and, uh, and my grandma Ursula. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, continuing with uh, Mr. A.J. Thomas uh, thing, um, there are two people in uh, Latin American continent, uh, Marquez and Borges. Uh, these two guys, you know, they took magical realism from Mahabharata. Uh, it's a give and take uh, thing. Uh, we look like, uh, you know, um, especially Indian, Indian women, uh, she looks like a Mexican. You know, the uh, Mexican <laughs> ladies. Take it as a compliment. It is a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, our food is very similar, similar. spicy. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Octavia Pass wrote a, a beautiful book on India. If you want to, uh, uh, learn about India, our soil. Uh, may I interject? The Melquiades, you know, the Melquiades. prophets. See, his, it is Sanskrit, you know. Yeah. Like uh, yeah, it was, uh, clothes say. hung out to dry on a clothesline. That's clothes how line. the uh, mm -hmm. Sanskrit has been. So, yeah. sans so there is definitely a, an Indian connection there. Yeah, somewhere. yeah. Right. He, his mother tongue is uh, Sanskrit, the Melquiades. Uh, mother tongue is uh, Sanskrit, and he writes the hundred years history before uh, time, before, you know. Uh, he, he must be a Sanskrit uh, a Brahmin. <laughs> <laughs> His mother tongue is Sanskrit. <laughs> so, uh, there's a give and take. We, we take uh, a magical realism, uh, their food, their, their appearance, everything. Uh, and they take magical realism from Mahabharata. Uh, if you read um, Borges Aleph, the story Aleph, uh, he, he says, I took this uh, fabulous, uh, fantastic uh, thing from Mahabharata. When Krishna opens his mouth, yeah. uh, the, 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 yeah. his mother, you know, so looks at the whole universe. In it. Like that, you know, in, in, in the word letter Aleph, the protagonist uh, looks at the universe, you know. The give and take. We, we are, you know, we don't take anything from Russian literature. They are very different culturally appearance, everything snow, but we have we, uh, you know, uh, uh, affinity with uh, Latin I, th I think it's not only the food and the look, it's also the history Culture. of colonialism. And colonialism, colonial banana republic, banana yeah, exploitation. Right. Absolutely, that whole <laughs> idea. One last question to all of you, uh, one personal question to all of you before I throw the uh, floor open for questions. Your favorite Marquez novel, novels, characters, 
has to be 100 years. 100 years? That's <laughs> the one I started with. That's uh -huh. the one I know the most intimately. Mm -hmm. And that's the one I always recall. Of course, I've read you know, other novels. I love it. Sure. At the time of cholera, uh, the autumn patriarch, and many of the short stories as well. Um, but yeah, this is the one that really sticks. Okay. So it nothing displaced it from its pedestal? No, I don't Nothing think that you read so. subsequently? What about you? For me, uh, my favorite writer is um, Mario Barcaccioza. That's why when he got a Nobel Award, he would get credit. I have translated his um, uh, Marquez uh, Tuesday Siesta. That's a beautiful short story. He's a beautiful short story writer. Uh, my favorite is 100 Years of Solitude. Everybody's uh, favorite. <laughs> 100 Years of Solitude. Do you differ? <laughs> no, no, but 100 Years of Solitude is my favorite. Uh, okay. But there are, there, there are, you know, other equally uh, interesting uh, or even, you know, more accomplished. Uh, but uh, to me, I don't know, uh, Otomo the Patriarch. Is, right. a, is, is a great, it's a study in dictatorship, you know. Right, right. right. And the general in his labyrinth. Mm, it's mm. a macabre kind of, <laughs> you know, when Simon Bolivar, uh, you know, is afflicted mm -hmm. with this peculiar illness which he, which like he, Ursula, uh, he, he shrinks. Yeah, it, he shrinks, you know. And they, so that, uh, th these are all conditions that it's not about the, the story. All this is their, you know, their realities. They, uh, so that way, and I, if you don't mind, I just two minutes I'll take uh, to to uh, narrate a very uh, bizarre kind of thing. So I was uh, working in Libya uh, near Benghazi, uh, 160 kilometers south of uh, Azizabia was the place, and uh, I was there during uh, Colonel Gaddafi's time, the revolution, and after that also I went back. Right. And in 2014, uh, around. Marcus's death. I did not know that he was dying, you know. <laughs> so I was holed up in my apartment and, uh, you know, there were gun battles raging all around uh, our residential area mm -hmm. um, between the ISIS uh, right. supported uh, fighters and the government forces. And I was reading this uh, Gerard Martin's uh, the biography. official biography and uh, Living to Tell the Tale and News of a Kidnapping and the story of a shipwrecked sailor. All these four Marks, uh, Marquez's uh, great non-fiction writing. Mm -hmm. And most of them, you know, they are uh, uh, macabre uh, kind of scenes also about like uh, Escobar's uh, killing of the mm -hmm. captives. And all. So all this was happening when firing was going around, shells were exploding, oh. <laughs> this kind of thing. And Marquez's death, I come to know about a week later. No newspapers, so only through, uh, you know, uh, internet uh, things. So it was such a kind of feeling. So I just wanted to share that with you okay. here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, questions? One minute. Let her come with the mic. Hi. Um, this is to Mr. Nivedita. Um, interestingly, he said that, you know, that Borges is the philosopher and uh, Marquez is the, uh, uh, I guess, fabulist or uh, storyteller. And it made me think that, um, you know, Borges, though he's South American, um, he's also European in many ways in his imagination. And I yeah. think his father, if he had a so-called spiritual literary father, would actually be probably Kafka. Mm -hmm. I mean, his library of Babel is so Kafka-esque in its ontological structure. So Ont I guess this question is largely of ontology, mm. right? I mean, uh, it's not that, I don't think Marquez is bereft of philosophy. It's just that his ontology is different, you know? And perhaps the way he, of course, tells the tale um, has perhaps some sort of corollaries in Indian culture. And my question is, does this familiarity actually encourage us to read Marquez or, shies, uh, or makes us shy away from Marquez? Like, because these cults, like this idea of these long reigns or something, are something we're actually so-called, in a very sort of tacit way, uh, familiar with. These tropes are already familiar, but which perhaps a uh, library of Babel trope or a Kafkaesque trope rooted perhaps even in Judaism. I mean, uh, uh, Borges even wrote a story, I the Jew. Maybe he was not Jewish, but he really had this sort of, uh, sort of semitophilia or whatever you would want to. He was a philos, a semitophile, so to speak. So. Um, Sometimes, like, I learn German to read Kafka, um, to read Broch, to read a lot of writers which are actually more steeped in sort of Baroque storytelling, mm -hmm. like uh, Hermann Broch or uh, 
um, even Kafka, who is like perhaps, although he would have resisted this sort of nomenclature, um, um, an expressionist of sorts. Um, so my question is, is it, so I was never, I never found Marquez appealing because I found it already too familiar for me, you know? Uh, and it's interesting that Kerala and, uh, and Tamil Nadu are just neighbors and perhaps there's a communist reason or whatever. Um, sometimes you read the writers for the wrong reasons also, you know, in the sense you may come across someone because he has a particular, particular cultural connection, but may not necessarily at all adhere to the philosophy that brought you there, you know? like. Um, like, I mean, freaking uh, Piran Delo sided with the fascist because he was, he was not a fascist. He needed, uh, he needed uh, Mussolini's support, you know, to be to, to right, to support his uh, wife who was mentally unwell. So my question is, like, does this sometimes, I mean, you said that, that Marquez or magical realism didn't play much of a role in Tamil letters okay. and that we were looking more at sort of, Okay. you know, European existential mm -hmm. literature or even Sart. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think that part, part of the reason could be is that it's so familiar that you don't seek the foreign, so to speak? No, essentially the question is uh, the familiarity of Marxism. Familiarity, yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> yeah, you, you explained, no. uh, you know, thing. Um, yes. Actually, uh, we have Borges not Mar Marquez in Tamil Nadu. Tamil, okay. uh, even Derrida, Jacques Derrida said, uh, we learnt structuralism, the basics of structuralism from um, Borges. Borges doesn't know the terminology of you know, structuralism or, and all that, but they take this, the aspects of, the basics of uh, structuralism and postmodernism from Borges. The, the, the theory of Aleph and uh, so many things, you know, the timelessness and, you know, the open-ended uh, thing. What is postmodernism? It, it, it uh, destroys uh, um, the authority of uh, the power of the author. That's why Roland Barthes said, author is dead. 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 So I, I, I give you open-ended text. You come in, you come in and, and play with the text. You create. This kind of text Borges gives us. So uh, we, we are, you know. Uh, no, I want to ask you to respond uh, to the in fact. In a, in a okay. nutshell, yeah. they are political, we are philosophical. As he said, <laughs> ontology. 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 It's, it's, uh, uh, it is think Mark is because of his communist association. It is not at that all that. Not like that? Ma for me, it is the magical sentences, you know, the language. The language, okay. Only from the aesthetic point of view. I may disagree with his, uh, you know, condoning uh, Politics. Uh, Fidel Castro, but it's sheer beauty of the language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a liberating kind of thing. Reading 100 Years of Solitude, I, I, I mentioned I felt liberated. Yeah. So this is because of the aesthetic experience, pure aesthetic experience of the language. No, forget about the plot. But reading, the pleasure of reading, sure. it, it's inimitable. I want to add two more names. Alejo Carpentier of Cuba, as you said, he's a, he is uh, considered as a Baroque writer, and Julio Cortazar. It's beauty, so like said, a, the aesthetics. A, uh, 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 Brazilian writer, you know, Jorge Amado. Yes. Very, very interesting writer. Hmm. Very interesting means, you know, his uh, home is the sailor, for example, if you have... Don't floor and her two husbands. It, it's it's, 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 it's uh, sad that he didn't get that kind of acceptance like really? Marquez, but he is an equally important ah, writer important. that way. Because it's not only Marquez, it's not only magical realism, it is the kind of, like you said, it is uh, the, the kind of cultural similarities between us people and them, you know, the third world, the sure. kind of, like he said, uh, uh, the chili, the curries, <laughs> all these things yeah. are common yeah. for us, you know. Yeah. I mean, they may be, like, I've read Mr. Nivedita's work. It's mind blowing. It's like Kafka on cocaine. Like, if you read, <laughs> if you read Zero Degree, like Muni Andi's story, and it's killer. I mean, I fell in love with his work 10 years ago when a bluff published it. Um, but are we, are we seeking, um, I mean, what I'm saying is there's such a fascination with that continent, uh, which you were clearly expressing, and you, a Tamil writer and a Malayalam writer are so familiar with the literary tapestry of that continent 
So, but then you keep on saying it's like us. Then uh, are we not seeking home here, or are we seeking home elsewhere sometimes? Is the kind of larger question, like why yeah. is this continent that is so far away, geographically, sort of pushing our buttons just in the right way? I think you have a point in uh, you know, this Eurocentrism, right. how it you know, caught us, and how we try to wriggle out of it. You know, this is a process. And this process, I think, may, it's made easy by uh, this magical realist uh, kind of writing, or the South American writing. And going back to Borges is again, you know, repeating a European phenomenon, yeah. I think. So that, that thing is there. So that may be the reason why I am not, I'm not particularly, you know, li like about the robust German uh, kind of uh, this thing. I'm, I'm not a very great fan of that kind of thing. And uh, cerebral kind of... Uh, you know, to read a novel, you don't have to have a very cerebral uh, robustness. No, no. No, yeah, <laughs> with heart. Uh, yeah, I, I want to conclude this with, with this. Uh, uh, Marquez once said that uh, uh, Juan Dulfo's uh, Pedro Paramo is in my memory. He can uh, tell the novel, whole novel in mem with his memory. So this is one thing. And in my novel conversations with Aurangzeb, Aurangzeb goes to Chile and me meets <laughs> so many uh, political <laughs> guys. Oh, <interesting. laughs> so with Any in me, yeah, there's a, a lot of there. Latin American thing is there. With, you know, oh, there's a question here. Yeah. I'll come to you next. Yeah, just uh, th thank you so much, Charu and Thomas. I mean, I learned a lot from this. I think the point you made about magic realism, I mean, the, you know, the repeated invocation that there's something special about magic realism was countered by what Charu said. It is part of us in some sense, you know, maybe stories of things. But I think the real interesting question for me is, how much of this newness of magic realism is actually the newness of the genre of novel? It's not that there is no magic realism. The fact that it's produced within the genre of a novel, which apparently we didn't have, oh. right? And remember, we had this discussion earlier that in Tamil, that the word still they use for novel is novel. There and is no local him, word. What is the, uh, you know, what do you call for? Novel. novel in the thing. Novel. So okay, the I, point I is that name, but say novel. Novel. So, so the genre of novel is actually what, so magicalism if it's there, here, there is not the question. As you said, it is so much part of our life. Ah, it's yes. part of their yes, yes, yes. But yes. what is this about the idea of the novel, which you can say something about? You know, what are we more fascinated with that structure which has come to us in some way, the European, Latin American, etc.? Or is it something else? Why should the novel matter to us as a genre? Right. Well, he has that, a point. You know what? We are dealing here with realism. Novel, as an expression of realism, is what we are dealing with. Magical comes later, or sir comes later. It is realism. You have this uh, art form of the long form fiction in the 20th century as an expression of realism. This is, I think, this is what I feel. So you have a point there. Would you like to respond? And there's, otherwise, there's one more question. Maybe, I'm not sure. Uh, if you write politically, you are killed in Latin America. So may maybe because of that, it's, it's a, a tool. Magical realism is a tool, tool to survive. Maybe. I'm not sure. Other question? Yeah. Hello. Yeah, Thank you for the discussion. Uh, this question is for Mr. Thomas. Uh, so you said uh, that you fell in love with the sentences of you know, Marquez's book. I wanted to ask you, like, I remember, like, when I first read uh, uh, books by foreign authors and when they were, you know, part of the curriculum, it never occurred to me that, you know, it, they were translations, right? They were not original languages. Like, when you read uh, Chronicle of a Death Foretold, it's a translation, but you think, you know, it's a Marquez book. It's only later now that I have tran started to translate. And, like, you realize there is one person in between, right? Between the author and the reader, there's a, the text is migrating. And it doesn't occur to you when you read initially, at least, you know, as a novice reader. What do you think about it now? Like, the, the role translation plays and how... As a know, translator yourself. And uh, how you still think of a text as an author's text, right? Those sentences may not I, technically I, I, be Marquez. I'll come back to you with Mar quoting Marquez himself, right. you know. Marquez famously said, Gregory Rabasa is a greater, you know, his version of 100 Years of Solitude is much greater than the Spanish original. Maybe he is uh, exaggerating. But I'll say that the translation, that's what I read in English. 
And as a translator also, this, uh, yesterday also I was uh, you know, facing this question. Translator would have certainly, you know, the English translator would certainly have, you know, smoothed over the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Spanish original, but I'm very sure that the, the rhythm of the language is kept, the original is kept. Otherwise, you'll know, it, it will not be caught up with that, you know. If it is, uh, so that uh, translation is, uh, uh, like Marquez said, it is uh, even <laughs> better than the original, maybe. But, but again, we have to say that this is the English text that we are reading, not the Spanish. And I have, I have uh, one or two friends who learned, in one, uh, uh, specifically one uh, professor in, uh, in DU now, he learned Spanish to read uh, Marquez and others, uh, Latin American authors in the original. Like you uh, mentioned that you uh, learned uh, uh, German to read Kafka. So th th this, is the, this is the eternal question in how I think, you know, translation or the original. You know, this kind of thing is uh, inevitable because uh, as the uh, publishing trade, you know, as the book market goes, uh, you know, grows uh, to such an extent now, I think translation uh, will be, you know, mistaken for the original <laughs> most of the time. Yeah. So this is what I have to say. It's, but I find it so interesting because especially as young readers, yeah. that it, it, it is a translation doesn't occur to one at all, like when you're yeah, reading initially. Yeah, it's accomplished right? translation, yeah. you know, because the, 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 the translator is such a professional, such a perfectionist that uh, he has not stumbled over the yeah. translation. No, not only Gregory Rabasal, the other translators also. There are two, three more. That applies to Thank you. My Tamil cannot be translated into English. <laughs> I, am a, I am a superstar. I, I write like Bharati. Everybody says, in Tamil Nadu, everybody says, even my rivals, my, tam, tam, my Tamil is unbeatable. <laughs> I, I write like poetry. When I translated uh, Tarun Tejpal, he asked me, how, how does it uh, you know, uh, come, uh, the, the Valley of Masks? Hey, man. This translation is better than your English original <laughs> because I translated. <laughs> Before we close, final comments. <laughs> I wanted to just bring up the question of bad translations also because we're just talking about smooth and flowing translations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, like what 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 really uh, you know um, constitutes a very choppy kind of translation? I mean, what do we do with that? Because I mean, I've I, I've also read translations like that. I also translate from Spanish, Chilean poetry, for example, and. Uh, you know, in my, in, in my early days in translating some of those works, I found it was smoother because I had actually talked to that, you know, poet several times and I had visited Chile at that point in time. Um, but as my distance from the country grew, I also found that, that, you know, it was harder to, it was harder to, you know, keep up with the kinds of, uh, you know, community rituals that this writer talks about, for example. Uh, you, you know, because because everything's in this contemporary moment. Like I was saying, you know, I like work with living writers as far as possible. Um, but that said, we've had several online, you know, discussions in terms of, uh, you know, uh, Glendon School of Translation Studies in in Toronto, for example. He and I had this conversation there. Um, we had to have uh, we had to have his you know partner also translating a little bit, so that was quite interesting. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, then what does what does the fidelity of the translation really constitute? So I just want to leave with that. Yeah. Okay. Much food for thought. Yeah. I think we're out of time now. Thank you so much for being the so audience and such wonderful questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karthik. Thank you. Thank you.